afternoon and welcome to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm David Thompson, member of City Club Board of Governors. Members are, and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on th the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are AARP of Oregon, McKinley Irvin, Ibadrola Renewables, Airbnb, and Uber. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of them. At next week's Friday Forum, Representative Kirk Schrader will join Sandy McDonough, my boss, the Portland Business Alliance in a conversation about his experience being a blue dog in a red house and working across the aisle to try and avoid a government shutdown. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member at pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in today's program, Carrie Ritker will be facilitating a Q&A session with those in the live audience. Asking questions is a privilege of PDX membership. But anyone in the live audience here at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of your table, hold up the card, and a City Club staff will collect them before and during the Q&A session. And now for today's program. Over the last few years, Portland renters and homebuyers saw a huge surge in the cost of rent and homes. One policy solution that has been been proposed is increasing urban density and building more homes in existing neighborhoods. While many Portland residents support policies that increase urban density in theory, the experience of watching neighborhoods change in the last few years has alarmed many residents. Are we building the future we want for Portland? Are we destroying our past? How do the value and character of neighborhoods and how do we prevent displacement of neighborhoods as neighborhoods change? Joining us today is Brandon Hartle of Restore Oregon, Bing Sheldon of Sarah Architects, and Carrie Ricker, owner and land use attorney of the Garvey Schubert and Bears Portland office. Brandon Spencer Hartle directs statewide historic preservation and advocacy and his education at Re Restore Oregon. With degrees in community development and historic preservation, Brandon manages efforts to save Oregon's most endangered places, advancing local code enforcement projects, re revision products, and provides technical assistance to owners of historic places across Oregon. As a renter, graduate of a thousand friends of Oregon land use leadership initiative, and a bike commuter, Brandon strives to achieve a range of community goals through the creative reuse of the region's historic places. Bing Sheldon is a retired chairman and former and founder of Sarah Architects. His experience in master planning, mixed use facilities, and adaptive reuse of historic structures has shaped the city of Portland since the 1970s. Bing received a Bachelor of Economics from Tufts University and a Master's of Architecture from Harvard University in 1961. Bing is recognized authority in dealing with preservation and renovation challenges and is the recipient of a plethora of awards for community service with a local publication, publication hailing him as a visionary. As former chair of the City Planning Commission, he led the state's largest city-driven planning effort to produce the Portland downtown plan, which encouraged density and reduced sprawl. And finally, Carrie Richter 
is owner specializing in land use and municipal law in the Portland office of Garby, Schubert, and Bear. Ms. Richter has been involved in a number of contentious land use disputes within the metro area, including cases dealing with urban growth boundary expansion and others dealing with historic preservation. Ms. Richter served eight years as a member of the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission, three of which she was chair. She has also served as the chair of the Planning Law Division of the American Planning Association. Please join me in welcoming this fantastic panel. Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Richter, and we are going to open um, this present discussion this afternoon with a little bit of a state of the city, uh, a little background about how we got to where we are with density and, and historic preservation. The current population of the Portland metro area is 2.3 million people. In the next 30 years, it is expected to increase by 750,000 people to exceed 3 million. Portland added a little over 34,000 people since 2010, more than Washington, Clackamas, or Clark counties, uh, a total reversal from where we were 20 years ago. So far this decade, the city has been growing at almost twice the rate as it did in the 1990s. The density established in Portland is the result of our urban growth boundary, which was established in 1979. Since its creation, the Metro UGB has been expanded to include 13% more land from where it was originally drawn, but the population of the metro area has increased 62 by 62%. Portland, a city that is largely landlocked between other metro jurisdictions, has taken a strong policy position of encouraging greater densities, particularly within the central city, the inner east side, and along transit corridors. The market, coupled with more dense development codes, have driven most all, almost all new development towards existing centers and main streets. People want to live where they can walk to things, where jobs and services are close by, and where transportation is less expensive. This has placed intense development pressure on those 15-minute neighborhoods. Impacts including increase in land prices, which in turn encourages demolition and replacement of single-family homes with single-family or multi-family structures, which comes with a whole host of impacts, including additional traffic, parking, loss of open space, and loss of architectural continuity. As was pointed out in the affordable housing panel last week, the affordability gap is also growing. Increasing land values and an influx of new residents seeking to bask in the vibe of Portland have increased housing and rental prices faster than income growth. Finally, I want to give you a quick primer on historic preservation in Portland. Um, there are sort of three different ways that the city regulates historic resources. Uh, first, there is the listing on the National Register of Historic Places. That's a federal program. Um, and resources can be designated either as a district, multiple properties in a district, or as an individual property. Second, there are local landmarks, and finally, there are local conservation designations. To qualify, generally speaking, a structure must be 50 years old and must maintain some architectural merit, cultural or personal significance, uh, because of the building, the, the building is associated with a particular person, or because the building works together with other buildings to convey a certain significance. In 1984, the city surveyed 5,000 or so properties and created its only historic resource inventory. That inventory has never been updated since that date. To date, the city includes 16 National Register districts. Alphabet Historic District is one of the most well-known. Uh, the Irvington Historic District in Northeast Portland is the city's largest historic district. The Irvington Historic District includes more land area than all the rest of the historic districts combined. It was created in 2011. The city also includes six conservation districts located in North and Northeast Portland. Elliott, Kenton, Mississippi are some examples of those. Those were designated primarily because of their cultural significance. Um, development in these districts is subject to review against historic guidelines, ensuring the preservation and protection of each neighborhood's unique character. 
in total these areas comprise about five percent of the land area within the city of portland this point i'm going to turn it over to brandon to give us a little history of population building booms in portland more generally thank you carrie in preparing for today's talk one in which I will talk about the future of historic buildings, I can't help but to look backwards. For a city that has come to unabashedly naval gaze in the limelight of the New York Times and Portlandia, we take surprisingly few opportunities to learn from our past without it turning into a mere exercise and resting on the laurels of past greats. 77 years ago, historian and philosopher Lewis Mumford addressed this very audience with a proclamation just as relevant today as it was then. According to Mumford, the land most needed to be controlled has gotten into the hands of those who will make industrial sites of it. Your neglect in letting this fine land with its wonderful scenic beauty get away from you has made me wonder if you are good enough to have it in your possession. So, Portland, are we good enough for the city we've inherited? Today, Portland is sending a house a day to the landfill. Along with these houses go the tall trees, embodied energy, community character, and cultural continuity that make our city's neighborhoods truly great places to live. Out of the ashes of those 400 houses that we'll send to the landfill this year, Portland will get atomized asbestos, beige boxes, concrete carports, and some very angry NIMBYs. And since 92% of home demolitions do statistically nothing to advance our city's density goals, the NIMBYs might just have a point. We'll come back to that later. So let's look backwards, way back, Oregon Trail back, in the course of just a few years, Euro-American settlers poured into the Willamette Valley, building houses, towns, and cities in the Eden that indigenous people stewarded for thousands of years before. As a product of that manifest destiny, Portland's population more than doubled every decade from 1850 until 1910. And think about that. This city doubled in size every 10 years, if not tripled in size for decades. But 1905, arguably, gave our city its first true housing crisis. Although just 160,000 people lived here at the time, 1.6 million tickets were sold to our Lewis and Clark exposition of that year. Our World's Fair put immense pressure on housing availability, giving birth to our city's first true apartment buildings, and enticing 100,000 people to move here in the course of five years. Although Portland's growth rate slowed after, in the decades after the fair, World War II brought with it another explosion in population growth. Between temporary war housing projects and maximizing the capacity of existing buildings, this city absorbed tens of thousands of new residents, many of whom, unsurprisingly, decided that they wanted to stay here after the war. A 1948 City Club report found that, quote, neither private enterprise nor the Portland Housing Authority has met the permanent housing needs of low-income groups. That was in 1948, but it sounds just as familiar today. So for anyone who blames today's housing crunch on land use regulations, history tells us that housing crises happened long before either preservation rules or the establishment of our urban growth boundary. So why do I give all this background? Because this isn't Portland's first time at the rodeo. And hopefully, we've learned something from our past housing crises. Whether we like it or not, this is a once in a generation moment for our city. But I question the region's leaders, architects, builders, and property owners. Are we indeed good enough to ensure our inherited sense of place is not lost? Bing, you are going to give us a little background of sort of the, 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 the rise of regulation of historic preservation in National Register districts. Well, um, I think uh, my answer to Brandon is we are capable of managing our own affairs. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, a lot of the reason that Portland is Portland is because um, we have uh, ensconced the values of the community as best we can in design guidelines, uh, zoning uh, regulation, and historic preservation. Um, I guess I would say, um, I think Brandon has painted a somewhat dismal picture. Um, I would use the argument that uh, the Alphabet District, which is Northwest Portland, which is the densest part of the city, um, is a perfect example of how these um, currents, um, the current development boom, 
can be worked effectively within a neighborhood context. Um, there's a lot of building that has been done in the Northwest District. Uh, it's been argued over incessantly. Um, the Northwest District Association is a very articulate and politically savvy organization, um, and they have represented the neighborhood values, I think, quite effectively. And they've dealt with developers um, and produced, uh, in my opinion, great new dense buildings which fit within the historic character of the neighborhood. So to me, um, the Northwest Association is an illustration of how the city can accommodate density, uh, make it consistent with neighborhood character, and as long as we have active participation from the citizens of that neighborhood, the values that they value will be protected. And to me, that's a bottoms-up approach to how uh, the citizens can engage themselves and guide development. And uh, remember, uh, cities have to change. Um, we're, if, you, if you don't change positively, cities will change negatively. Um, so I think that this is wonderful, what's happening to Portland right now. Um, I can tell you that when we drafted the original downtown plan, we put in the document that we wanted 5,000 residential units in downtown in 1973. Not anybody, me included, thought that that would ever happen. Now, I mean, so from my point of view, this is wonderful. Bring it on. Let's talk a little bit more about the Alphabet Historic District. The Alphabet Historic Guideline states, uh, this was a community-driven process that began at the end of the 1980s when the residents of Northwest Portland became concerned about the demolition of historically significant buildings to make way for development. Sounds a little bit like the concerns we're hearing a lot of today. Um, the Alphabet Historic District is, in the Northwest District generally is the most dense neighborhood we have in the city and it's still is growing and is still becoming more dense. Um, your firm, Sarah, is responsible for much of the new development within the Alphabet Historic District. And we hear a lot of talk about how, uh, I remember when I was on the Landmarks Commission about how it's so uh, difficult to design a compatible building given the design guideline restrictions. Um, and your firm has been able to do it successfully and build incredibly appropriate highly dense buildings. Could you talk a little bit more about what makes the Alphabet Historic District so popular and why your developments in these areas work? Well, I think it's popular because it is so diverse. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that the current influx of population, uh, for the first time in my lifetime, cities are where people want to live. Um, suburbs are no longer the place everybody wants to go to, uh, which certainly was the case after World War II. But you now have boomers who are moving back in, and they want the security of, um, and the lack of maintenance of a home. And uh, the young kids who are working here, they, they would prefer to live in the city because of transportation and, and entertainment and cultural assets. So to me, um, it's obvious why Northwest District is popular. Um, you know, you just spend a little time walking down 23rd Avenue and you, it's, it's amazing, you know. An ice cream shop has a line halfway around the block. Um, but one of the things you talked to me about before was the mixed use nature of the Northwest neighborhoods that is in contrast with it, neighborhoods on the east side, for example, that are solely single-family residential. I didn't quite hear you, Carrie. The mixed-use nature of the Northwest neighborhood right. helped it become diverse. No, absolutely. And, and the city is currently now studying mixed-use densities outside of the core, um, which is appropriate. Um, no, those, uh, those mixed-use neighborhoods are... Um, are wonderful and and the neighborhood um, approved them and supported them right from the get-go so 
years ago, um, our firm was approached by a developer who wanted to build a building for Kitchen Caboodle, and part of the site was zoned residential. And I asked him what he wanted to do with it. Oh, he said, I have no interest in that. I'm going to sell it off for a triplex. I asked him, would it be okay if I went and talked to the NWDA planning committee? Oh, he said, they're a bunch of crazies, but if you want to go, fine. And um, I went to them and said, okay, um, we have three quarters of the land zoned commercial, and there's going to be a kitchen and poodle store on it, and then the back portion will be residential, and it'll be a triplex. Um, we could have a mixed-use building and get more density. Oh, well, how many units do you think you could get? Um, well, you know, I don't know. We haven't designed it, but, you know, five. So the answer was, if you can get five or more units, we'll approve a mixed-use project. And at the time, the building code didn't even recognize a mixed-use project. Um, it was brand new in Portland. We wound up with 10 units on top of a kitchen caboodle. And it's still, I think, a perfect example of mixing density and increasing density and uh, bringing people onto busy streets. And um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just think mixed use development, which was uh, never popular until very recently with financing folks, has suddenly come into its own. I think people recognize that it's activating the streets and providing more people is what cities are all about. And I think NWDA and the North Districts Association have accommodated that growth enormously and successfully. Thank you. For those of you just turning in on OPB, I'm Carrie Richter here at the City Club Friday Forum discussing housing and historic preservation with Bing Sheldon of Sarah Architects and Brandon Spencer Hartle of Restore Oregon. Brandon, give me some success stories associated with preservation in recent history in your mind. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest success stories for preservation is that preservation isn't about house museums. And preservation is about finding a route to sustainability. We cannot build our way towards a healthy planet. We have to conserve our way there. And our building stock is no different. Speaking about economic sustainability, we know that rehabilitation creates more jobs per dollar spent than manufacturing, mining, forest products, or new construction. So given that we get more bang for our buck with rehabilitation than new construction, I always wonder why we measure our economy in housing starts. If we want to truly measure economic development, we ought to be measuring the kitchen and bathroom remodels that everyone in this audience is doing in their homes. For policy wonks, 2015 has been a banner year for historic preservation in Oregon. We started the year off with the introduction of the Revitalized Main Street Act, legislation that would have created meaningful incentives for the rehabilitation and seismic upgrade of historic commercial buildings across our state's traditional downtowns. Uh, because many of these buildings sit vacant and at risk of collapse in a seismic event, the modest $12 million state investment that the act proposed would have resulted in a fourfold increase in the number of downtown landmarks rehabilitated, reused, and celebrated by their communities, not to mention the creation of 500 new jobs a year in some of our, most, our state's most economically challenged area. While 35 other states already have similar programs with documented records of success, legislators did not pass the revitalized Main Street Act this session, restore Oregon back to the Capitol to ensure that our region's Main Streets get the investment they need to be active, accessible, and resilient. On the legal side, just last week, the Land Use Board of Appeals gave Oregon preservationists the keys to a new era of complex adaptive reuse projects. In a case concerning a uh, 1912 hydroelectric power plant on the side of Mount Hood, the court decided to interpret our land use laws to mean that historic preservation wasn't just about inventory designation and regulation, but that historic preservation really is about economic viability. In their decision to allow this small power plant to adapt to a commercial use, the court has given the go-ahead for scores of underutilized warehouses, schools, barns, and churches across the state to receive a zoning accommodation that will bring them back to life in a big way. In their decision to allow obsolete historic buildings the flexibility to be adaptively reused, the Land Use Board of Appeals took one more practical step in modernizing our landmark planning system. For the first time in 40 years, many of our state's most challenged historic buildings 
especially those outside of Portland's core, will have a practical path towards their reuse and preservation. And finally, I want to say one thing about affordable housing. Historic buildings in downtown and across Oregon have been home to affordable housing units for decades. The past year has ushered in a new wave of affordable housing projects inside of National Register listed historic buildings. From the 1910 Julian Hotel in Corvallis, to the 1912 Erickson Saloon in Old Town, to the 1905 Brono Apartments just up the street on Morrison, 2015 will see hundreds of new and upgraded units of affordable housing in historic buildings. Actually, because of the availability of non-competitive federal tax credit dollars, historic buildings truly are some of the most appealing opportunities for our region's community development corporations to build affordable housing units. The, the one thing I want to clarify about the recent Luba case is that that is an owner-initiated effort. It can't be a neighborhood seeking to preserve a structure through that process, but it is a very powerful tool. Now let's move to the challenges facing preservation. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting, when you look at goal five, which is our resource protection goal, um, it includes natural resources, wetlands, riparian areas, wildlife, scenic and historic areas, and open spaces. It's sort of all of the reasons why we like to live in Oregon, all of the reasons we like to live in Portland. Um, and, and you look at the administrative rules implementing them, and there is a whole lot more structure and rigor and requirement associated with those natural resource goals than our built environment goals. Uh, even Metro has a whole title of its urban growth management functional plan dedicated to uh, wildlife and riparian areas, wetlands, and we don't, Metro has no requirements for historic preservation, yet it is such a central component to what we call community in Portland. Um, so that's one of the challenges I think facing pres faces preservation. One of the other things I pointed out earlier is that the city hasn't updated its historic resource inventory since 1984, and it contained 5,000 structures at the time. It is obsolete, and it really needs to be redone as part of uh, educating our population. One of the, another question I have for Brandon, um, there are significant changes happening across Portland, and what do you think isn't working? in terms of the city's efforts to preserve historic resources. So I want to start off by saying Oregon is the only state in the country that prohibits cities from designating places as historic without the consent of the owners. Right now we have what some people have called a demolition epidemic. And it's interesting because of our city's 145,000 single family homes, nearly half were built before World War II. Since April, Restore Oregon has received notification of every single family house demolition in the city. I brought those notifications, notifications with me today to show the impact of what 172 houses being demolished in Portland this summer looks like. This year, we expect to see 400 homes demolished across Portland. Of those 400 homes, only 32 are being demolished to accommodate multifamily housing, which means the vast majority of houses that are coming down are coming down for more and larger single family houses. Research has shown that every time we raise an older house and replace it with a new one, even an energy efficient new one, it takes an average of 50 years to recover the climate change impacts related to the demolition. And where I think things get really interesting, in this community we value recycle, reuse, environmental stewardship. Of those houses that are coming down, only 2% of the waste, 2% is being salvaged for reuse. Uh, the average demolished house here in the city of Portland was built in 1930. It's 1,340 square feet and generates 58,558 pounds of landfill waste that goes straight to the landfill. Uh, I think one thing to mention is that the council, with the mayor's leadership, has uh, required a 35-day delay for demolitions, but there exists no tool to stop perfectly viable housing from being lost, especially when that replacement does not add to our community's goals. I do want to give one quick example of an a, a area where this owner consent provision may be working counter to our goals as a community. I'm going to look at the Burger Barn, which is a nondescript building on Northeast Martin Luther King. This little one-story wood frame building that sits on a site zoned for much higher density tells a story that Portland would be remiss to lose. Owned and occupied by African-American families since 1906, 
The building was the site of a Black Panther riot and the infamous 1981 possum incident that inflamed racial tensions with the Portland Police Bureau. Today, a group of longtime residents are working to find an option or an opportunity to rehabilitate and reuse this building. Because the building is not able to be designated against the will of the owner, it could be torn down at any time to make way for new apartments. I mention this because the rapid loss of landmarks in North and Northeast Portland amounts to nothing short of cultural gentrification. The lifting of the owner consent requirement would allow the city to protect places like the Burger Barn and swaths of East Portland that are significant to populations who may not have the access needed to compete with highly capitalized developers. You're doing well. For those of you just turning in on OPB, I'm Carrie Richter here at the City Club Friday Forum discussing housing and historic preservation with Bing Sheldon of Sarah Architects and Brendan Spencer Hartle of Restore Oregon. So Bing, your response to the number of demolitions and voice concerns about the changing housing market. Uh, well, again, I think um, uh, it, <coughs> It's a concern that should be reflected within each neighborhood. So um, the city does have a prohibition against demolition, um, and the Northwest District recently did prevail on that issue. I believe it's the first time the city council refused to allow the building to be demolished. It was to be replaced with higher density housing. Um, so I, to me, the tools are there and um, neighborhoods need to organize. If they consider something of value, I think, um, and they can make the, the appeal to city council, there is a way for that to occur. Um, I guess, um, it, to me, um, uh, I don't get personally very excited about, as Brandon does, about uh, the number of demolitions. Um, uh, it, it's, the, the city of, of Portland is not made up by buildings. It's made up by neighborhoods who feel committed to the values of the neighborhood. And I'm a believer that uh, regulation should be more bottom-up driven rather than top-down driven. So I told Brandon earlier that I would be personally opposed to remove uh, owner consent as part of the state law for preservation. Um, I think that, um, again, um, it's, um, we have bigger problems to resolve, and I think we have um, solutions to resolve them. And again, I'll come back and point to the Northwest District Association as being, uh, it's still accommodating uh, a lot of new development. Uh, the Conway site, for example, uh, which was formerly industrial and largely parking lots, is, there are buildings going up almost every day. Um, <clears throat> so um, if we want to respect our land use goals of containing sprawl, we want to continue to build a vital uh, walking city, uh, we have to accommodate density. And I think um, we do a pretty good job of it. Um, we could do better, of course, but again, I come back to understanding that it's really up to the citizens who live within their community to figure out what's valuable to them, what do they want to protect, um, and, um, uh, and, and go for it. It's, um, so, I mean, I, in this case, I think from a land use point of view, the motto of the city that works, I think Portland does work. Brandon, you wanna, do you wanna respond? So one of the challenges in regards to the single family home demolitions, like I mentioned, 92% are followed by new single family houses. And when we look at our land use zoning system, we've identified corridors and centers for the location of where most of this region's or most of the city's growth will be absorbed. Very few houses are coming down on those corridors, and the ones that do come down oftentimes are highly altered or have lost their character. And so I'm, I'm unlikely to go to bat for a historic house or an old, not a historic, but just an older garden variety house on a corridor. 
But when we look at houses and neighborhoods that are being replaced by something that doesn't gain us anything as a community, that's when I get concerned. And I don't know if we're going to talk about the demolition tax or not today. Okay. We are. We are. Let's. Um, one of the things I think that's been interesting, being as you talk about neighborhood activism, and is sort of your your initiative with millennials. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, <clears throat> um, since it is obvious that we have a lot of new immigrants to the city, most of whom are millennials, um, I actually gathered a group of them together and said, um, "Well, what do you think of Portland?" And the answer was, "Well." It's wonderful. It was always like this. And I said, oh, no, it wasn't. Um, and uh, what do you think about the future of the city? Oh, it'll always be like this. No, it won't always be like this. Um, and uh, so I'm engaging with a large number of millennials uh, to try to first educate them about um, what it takes uh, in terms of uh, volunteerism and leadership uh, to protect the values which they moved here uh, for. And hopefully, um, before I meet my end, um, they'll have the opportunity to do what I think many of us who arrived in this city in the 60s did. Uh, we changed it, and we changed it for the better. And I think um, the next group that needs to adopt that strategy is the millennials, because when you absorb the kind of population that Metro predicts for us, uh, we're going to have to have enormous investments in transportation, in housing, um, and we don't have the federal dollars that were available back in the 60s and 70s. So um, these kids, and I guess I can, I'm, a, I'm okay to call them kids. Uh, because the oldest of which are in their mid-30s, um, these kids have to understand that the future of this city rests with them. And they have an obligation. And uh, so I'm going to kick them. And <laughs> OK, let's talk a little bit about the demolition tax. The mayor has put forward the idea of a demolition tax, $25,000 for the demolition of the building, plus a $25 charge for each year that the building is old. Uh, some have claimed that this will simply deter builders from constructing lower cost residents, instead opting to cover financial losses from the tax by building structures that will be more expensive. I want to get your thoughts on Mayor Hale's proposal. Bing, do you want to go first? Um, sure. I guess I would like to know uh, what, what, what is the revenue going to go towards? Uh, it's going to okay. go towards affordable housing. Affordable housing. Well, again, I guess um, that won't build the kind of the number of units we need, but I think it's uh, certainly a, a reasonable proposal. I don't think that um, that would discourage um, uh, people from, uh, I mean, it might discourage some people from tearing something down, but again, I suppose um, to me it's a reasonable trade-off if, um, if the economics of the market predict that a, a small house should get replaced with a larger house. Uh, the developer has already concluded there will be enough um, gain in that exercise to um, cover all the expenses. And I, I don't think another 25,000 is unreasonable. I guess I would hope, however, that we don't then relax and assume that that's going to pay for the kind of affordable housing inventory that we need in this town. Um, Seattle has a much better program for how to build affordable housing, and I would love to have us have that program here because their uh, affordable housing needs are more than adequately met by a bond levy that the city has passed three times in fi each time five years. Uh, so that's the scale of what we need to do in this town. So I guess the only thing I'd say is it seems like it's only a token. Brandon, your thoughts on the demolition tax? So I think one thing I do get excited about is that only 2% of building material from those single family houses are being salvaged for reuse. So I mentioned 400 houses will come down this year. The vast majority will come down for new single family houses. 
the impact of that demolition, this takes out any concrete that's recycled, metal that's recycled, that's salvage material, the impact of those demolitions will be sending 23 million pounds of waste from Portland to the landfill. Let's look at that in the equivalent of paper. That's 2.5 billion pieces of copy paper. So for everyone sitting in this room, that's the equivalent to crumpling and throwing away 4,100 pieces of paper. That's a really big environmental impact, and we've chosen to look the other way. So I think the thing that becomes interesting about taxing landfill, taxing demolitions, is how we can achieve broader community goals through what that money might go towards, but also through discouraging bad behavior. I'll pick on the mayor a little bit since he's here in the front row. I think that one of the opportunities as we have a good public dialogue about what is the external cost of demolition on the communities, and I'm glad we're having it now, is whether or not we need to incentivize deconstruction. The, the tax as proposed is flat on demolitions and demolitions only of single family houses in zones, zone four, single family houses. But I would encourage the mayor, and I'll be at city council next week to encourage the mayor and council to run with the idea to think about how we can reward good behavior like deconstruction, salvaging materials, like getting the neighborhood association to approve the plan for a new building that goes on the site, um, or finally coming up with ways to encourage affordable housing or, or innovative types of housing on the sites where we might be tearing down single family houses. And I don't, I don't personally believe every single family house is worth saving. Many of them can be replaced with something better. But when we have a restrictive zoning code and we don't have empowered neighborhoods, what we're getting really isn't better for our community. So we have to cover those external costs where we're seeing development that's not meeting the goals that Bing's talking about. For those of you just turning in on OPB, I'm Carrie Richter here at the City Club Friday Forum discussing housing and historic preservation with Bing Sheldon of Sarah Architects and Brendan Spencer Hartle of Restore Oregon. Let's talk a little bit about other creative solutions. One of the things that struck me about the affordable housing panel last week was the discussion about the cost $100,000 to construct an, a new housing unit in town, and your choices are $100,000 for a new housing unit or a tent, and there's nothing in between. And it seems to me that historic preservation provides that potential in between. And um, Brandon, you have some um, and Restore Oregon has some ideas about how we could encourage that in between. So for those of you who were here last week, there's a small neighborhood developer, Eli Spivak, who talked a little bit about how we might make better use of our single family zones. Yesterday, our neighborhoods had big families packed into small houses. Today, our neighborhoods have small families packed into big houses. And our zoning code doesn't make it easy to break from that trend. We need to ask, what is the spirit of Portland's neighborhoods? What are we trying to protect when we talk about neighborhood preservation? For me, and I think the common answer, is more about the buildings than what happens inside of them. So one option to put on the table, and the uh, current residential infill project is looking at this, is what if we allowed older and existing houses to be repurposed into duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, what if we can find additional density in areas that we haven't critically thought about before? What if we had a situation where you could have more than five unrelated adults living in a house that's already 2,500 square feet? Citywide, we have only 7,000 plexes. I live in one. Um, because the code takes single family quite literally. I think there's an opportunity to innovate within our single family zones. And along these lines, I'm going to throw out an idea that excites me. I think we need lots of basement housing units. I'm all about basement housing units. Let's permit lots and lots of them. And here's why. Because we have a seismic elephant in the room, and it's in all of our rooms around long-term policy discussions related to the built environment. Most of our city's houses will probably survive the earthquake, but unless they're tied to a good foundation, it could be months or years before that house is occupiable again. If we think we have a housing crisis today, just imagine how bad it'll be after a 9.0 earthquake and we're all living in a park. Having more basement housing units and looking at creative ways to maximize our existing single family houses will make us seismically resilient and also help accommodate a variety of housing types geared towards different income levels. Bing, what kind of solutions do you see that we need to, to instigate now to keep Portland a place where millennials want to live? Well, I certainly agree with Brandon that um, um, 
having uh, more use of large single family homes uh, than is currently allowed in a single family zone is perfectly appropriate. Um, it's what happened in the city, frankly, uh, during World War II. Um, uh, we've, we rented this huge Victorian house when we arrived here in 64 for $75 a month. There were uh, sinks in every bedroom, and it was clear that that house probably accommodated eight to 10 uh, worker bees working in the shipyards. And um, uh, so I, I think that um, we need to look at all kinds of uh, innovative ways to accommodate um, people in existing housing, and that would be um, basically cost-effective. Uh, it is true that new construction is expensive, uh, but rehabilitating older historic homes to accommodate smaller uh, single occupants would be a perfect solution, so I would agree with it. We are now going to open up the Q&A portion of the program. If you have written a question on an index card, please hold it up high so the city staff or city club staff can collect it from you. We will now take questions from the audience. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of city club membership, and membership is open to everyone. I can't find, I can't see for the lights. Please identify yourself as City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. And we don't, uh, and we don't Rahm, have... Uh, member of City Club. The story of early Portland is told in the approximately 100 historic buildings in the West End where we are. They date from 1880 to 1935. Most are not protected by historic register status. Um, the West Quadrant Plan building heights are for 350 and 425 feet plus for this area, 425 feet allowed over this building, for example, um, and this will threaten many of these buildings and our history. Uh, it will also threaten many affordable housing units in this neighborhood. Um, we have one of the densest neighborhoods for affordable housing in the West End. Um, should these heights be revisited for the West End, and should the demolition tax also be extended to the West End? Thank you. Well, I think, um, um, I think clearly um, uh, that th those heights were very controversial at the time they were uh, dreamed up uh, by the uh, central city plan, and uh, uh, I guess I would say um, uh, if neighborhoods feel strongly that um, some elements, uh, historic pieces should be retained in spite of um, the density, um, you know, let's figure out how to put them on the register because then you could transfer the density to another site. I mean, the city wants to accommodate growth uh, and density in downtown because this is where most people want to be. Um, so um, I think there's a vehicle to preserve buildings um, and preserve density. We need to find the right way to do it. And again, I would put that firmly in charge of people who live downtown. Uh, figure out what solution you think makes sense. One of the interesting pieces of the West End is we have a lot of vacant surface parking lots, and that's the case in, in many parts of our community, both downtown and along our corridors, and we're going to have to figure out a way to turn those vacant parking lots into housing, job opportunities, and something that more reflects our values as a community. So I'd like to see those happen first. But in terms of where we see pressure on older buildings in the West End, right now many of those buildings are listed on the Historic Resource Inventory. In the city's zoning code, there's a 120-day delay given to historic resource inventory, if not for one small subsection of the code that says, unless someone comes to the city and asks to come off the inventory. If we had that subsection of the code removed and we could have 120 days of conversation with a developer, with a, with a builder, to see if we might be able to incorporate parts of an older and historic building to come up with a better plan, that could give us some opportunities to negotiate also give us opportunities to discuss the low-income housing tax credits and the historic rehabilitation tax credits that many builders are unaware of, 
but could get us some really good projects if we had that conversation. Go ahead and have it. Good. <laughs> uh, I'll take the next, next question. Virginia Cornyn, City Club member. This question is primarily for Brandon. In last week's presentation, the current shortage of low-income housing in the city is between 25,000 and 35,000 units. Do you have any projection of what the impact on that gap would be by doing the adaptive reuse of historic buildings? I don't have a number that I can answer for that. But what I do know is one of the um, impetuses for the revitalized Main Street Act that was proposed in the legislature would to develop a critical mass of uh, funding, uh, funding sources to allow some older buildings to be rehabbed and reused. And given the low income housing tax credit and some of the incentives that are out there, that program would have, and we hope in the future, would shift the dial to make more dense and creative projects happen. Uh, in terms of the exact number, um, I don't know. But what I do know is that we've had in the last several years, like the projects I mentioned, hundreds of units come online. It's not going to meet that 25,000 number. But if we look at the Rich Hotel or the Musoff Manor or Chaucer Court just up the street, we have some first-rate affordable housing projects in historic buildings in the city that we should be proud of. And I'd love to see more. Next question. I really enjoyed the positive statements made about the Northwest District Association as a member. But I've also worked for buildings in other neighborhoods, and other neighborhoods don't have the strength of volunteers with a knowledge of development and historic preservation. They have their heart there, they want to save buildings that are important, but they don't have the same people on their boards to help do that. How can we create a more equitable city for historic preservation at the neighborhood level? Well, <clears throat> I guess I would agree. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised at that statement. Um, again, I'd say, um, I'd turn to my buddy Brandon over here. Uh, so why doesn't Restore Oregon start uh, educating neighborhoods to get organized about how to protect historic resources? Um, it's, um, um, you know, I think um, the two neighborhoods I'm most familiar with are, of course, Northwest and Irvington both of which have, I think, well-organized and highly articulate uh, people who uh, follow land use and um, really look out for the neighborhood character. Um, and uh, I think, um, so if we need to educate people on how to do it and why to do it, um, again, I would say uh, let Restore Oregon take charge of it. Well, <laughs> before Brandon responds, one of the things that the Landmarks Commission asked the City Council for for the last five or six years at least is money to update our historic resource inventory. I don't think the city is acting responsibly when it's not doing its education job in terms of educating the population about what fantastic resources we have. And that can be done both in terms of architectural expertise, but also out going out and collecting the cultural community experience from residents that may have been displaced from these neighborhoods that have been gentrified. Um, I think that when we first approached the city council and asked for money to update the historic resource inventory, we asked for 300,000. That's what we thought it would take eight years ago. I think this last year, I think the estimate was 1 million. So that's a lot of money to put into an educative uh, effort. But I truly believe that if we got neighborhood support, it would help educate and rally, uh, particularly millennials who want to know who, what, what these houses are next door and at the corner and what happened in the corner store and what happened at the burger barn and what happened in these buildings. So. So Bing, when I go and do that, I'm bringing you with me because I think that there's a lot to be learned from some of our positive success stories of where we've added density sensitively to some of our neighborhoods. So you and I are going to do the program together. All right. But I think one You're of the on. good. <laughs> I, I think one of the challenges, especially as we look outside of our historic core, is we don't have places that are designated that the you know, the community um, has been empowered to rally around. We only have one designated historic place east of 82nd. That's crazy. That's a big part of the city that has many buildings and many places to be proud of. 
not only architecturally with some great mid-century modern buildings, but also culturally that represent the significance of that part of town. I'm gonna mention one quick example, and that's the Jansen Beach Carousel, which was a, a place on uh, Hayden Island where people of all backgrounds, income levels, um, kind of life situations, would take their kids to go enjoy a carousel. And three years ago, that carousel was put in storage so we could get a large big box development. And that carousel is yet to be uh, reinstalled as promised. That was a neighborhood that fought to keep that one piece of its identity, but didn't have the political support and the bigger community support to do it. Our organization has been working to get that carousel back and get that back to being a place where people can enjoy. But I think we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm glad that you asked the question, because we, we really do need to think creatively about what places are special. They're not all beautiful historic buildings, but they may be special, and we've got to figure out ways to keep them around. Absolutely. Another question. Thank you. My name is Catherine Nikolovsky. I'm a City Club member. The idea of 400 homes in Portland being sent to the landfill every year is a powerful image. But when it comes to the demolition of single-family homes, and the expansive residential landscape that reflect the neighborhood identity of Portland, it appears that much of the devolution that upsets a community is not solving the problem of density, it's accommodating a new culture of higher income residents, and in its trail creating a patchwork of neighborhood socioeconomic extremes we haven't quite experienced as a city before. If we want communities to be responsible for upholding the values of their neighborhood in a bottom-up approach, as you say, how much responsibility should the city leadership have to facilitate community influence of long-term residents who feel like they may be powerless as they're experiencing the threat of displacement, root shock, or pricing out? Bang. Uh, well, again, I think that was the original purpose for the city uh, helping to support and fund neighborhood activation. And uh, the, the city does have I can't remember how many, but there's, Charlie, you know, I mean, neighborhood, how many? A hundred. Um, so um, it, it's, there, there is a, a, a sort of um, a, a work plan for how neighborhoods can get support. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess maybe Brandon and I have to go out there and start <laughs> telling everybody, hey, get organized. <laughs> I will say one thing, and, and, and the mayor and council, uh, effective in April, and why I get all these notices in the mail, gave neighborhood associations the ability, and, and the individual in the room who wants to pay 1300 bucks, to delay for up to 95 days the demolition of a single family house. The process is complicated. A group of us recently got together to create a guide to help people through the process of receiving that delay period, but there needs to be more tools in place probably from the city that give neighborhood associations some power back to have good conversations about what's worth keeping and what's you know worth letting go. Again, I think maybe the demolition tax gives us an opportunity to talk about that. But as we look at code revisions for our residential single family zones, as we look at how to better manage demolitions, giving neighborhood associations some power so that they can negotiate with the developer so they can get a good product and they can run with that would be really important. All right, we have time for one last question. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Lammers, and I'm a civic associate with the City Club of Portland. Um, Brandon, you mentioned that 2% of the only 2% of the waste from these uh, demolitions um, is reused. Uh, why isn't that number higher, and what steps can be taken by these crews to increase that number? Really good question. There's a group of people who have been organized in Bureau Planning and Sustainability called the Deconstruction Advisory Group, or DAG. Um, so we spend our like Wednesdays doing DAG stuff. Uh, but there are some really great contractors in this community who know how to take a building apart and know how to sell those materials uh, at the rebuilding center or at salvage works or even overseas in places like Japan where people are buying our building materials. The challenge though is it takes more time to deconstruct a house, an extra week or 10 days, and it actually costs a little bit more money than going out there with a backhoe. So for the addition of something like eight to twelve thousand dollars we can pick a path to salvage up to seventy percent of a building for reuse here in this community or uh, out around the world it creates more jobs um, and the city actually has a small grant program established two weeks ago to encourage some test cases about deconstruction but there's certainly a market there we've got to build up to it but it'd be a fantastic way for us to set ourselves apart from the rest of our cities nationally
We have run out of broadcast time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join me in thanking our panel and producer of the program, Andrew Davidson.